Welcome to Creation in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Carl Ball, founder and director of the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. The title to today's program will hopefully spark an interest in you to call a friend because we're going to try to solve some problems in the program today. The title is Past the Test! Exclamation point. Now, the Bible has been critiqued ever since the first book of Moses hit the press. And by the press, I mean off the direct pen of the inspiration of God. And of course, the book of Job was written in antiquity. Other books God produced by divine inspiration, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, the Word of God is precisely that, the Word of God. And as every generation offers a new critique of the Word of God and a new direction, and falling short, they try for another avenue and simply ignore their failures in the past to in any way dent and put a chink in the armor of the Word of God. And as I read these periodically, and I'm preoccupied with the defense of the truth and the Word of God itself. As I read these, I'm reminded of day past when the blacksmith was popular in the early founding of these great United States and other parts of the world when horses were the mandate for transportation and for valor and exercise in war. I remember reading early in school about the village blacksmith. And I, I read later an incredible analogy of the Word of God. Last eve I paused beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Look again, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all those hammers so? Just one, said he. And then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's word, for ages skeptic blows have beat upon. And though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the hammer's gone. Well, in every generation, we have a new introduction of data supposedly critiquing the word of God, and supposedly annihilating the veracity and the absolute authority of the Word of God. Now, today we have a special guest. Dr. Floyd Nolan Jones has been my guest on this program many times, and we're approaching a critique where the long ages have been pronounced by academia in this generation, and theologians have caught on with the critique and have surmised that the Word of God may not be absolutely true, but instead is relatively true. So we're going to see who passes the test. And by the way, as we examine the veracity of the Word of God and critique some dates and times in chronology, remember that the critic is actually the one being tested. The Word of God has been proven to be true. I welcome today a dear brother a scholar. In fact, Dr. Floyd Nolan Jones, this is the many, many times you've been on the program, and this is a special time to welcome you because, as you know, you're the leading chronologer of our generation and uh, biblical chronologer, and I appreciate your work. Thank you, Carl. It's always good to be here. It's nice to know after all these invitations you invited me back again. Oh, there are many <laughs> more to come. <laughs> now, we're dealing with a very intricate subject today, as you know. But you live in this world. That's the reason I invited you here. As you know, the Bible is being critiqued as never before and ignored as never before. And as you know, being a theologian yourself, many theologians have bought into this surmise that the Bible may not be absolutely correct. Yep, Carl, one of the things we want to make sure our audience gets today is um, people are always telling us, well, you have no, no evidence, no real proof 
uh, concerning the veracity and accurateness of Scripture. Today we're going to show that some of the most ancient data existing on the earth actually verifies the Bible. The truth is, because we're Bible believers, um, for us, the Bible is going to verify that they did a good job yes. instead of reverse. But for most of our audience, we're going to show them that one of the most ancient stories in all Scripture actually has enormous secular outside yes. evidence supporting the time zone. Which is vitally important. And you as a scientist and a scholar, and by the way, both of us in the past have questioned the reliability of the Word of God. I was an evolutionist. Yes, and there was a time I espoused evolution. So we're approaching this from a logical viewpoint, and you are the scholar to take us down the road. Let's go to Babel. Let's do it, brother. Carl, as we see here, when we go to Genesis chapter 10 and 11, and that's, you know, that's back at the very beginning of the Bible. So if we've got anything that's going to support something happening in Genesis 10 and 11, this is going back about as far in history oh, yes. as we can go. As can be secularly confirmed. Correct. There's a, a character, a personality there named Nimrod. Most, I have heard of him. Yes, but most Christians don't realize what a big hitter Nimrod is in Scripture because we're such poor readers, and today we hope to help them understand. The Scripture tells us that Nimrod, who was the first son of Cush and the grandson of Ham, did three major things. He built the city of Babel. Uh, by the way, Babel is the, he is the Hebrew. It's the same as Babylon. That's the Greek. Yes. Okay? And he founded the world's first kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, I want our audience to consider the originally... We had an agrarian society, a farming society. You know. Of necessity, people yes. have to eat. Right. We, we had sheep, we had cattle, and we had cotton and corn and taters, you know, and <laughs> stuff like that. Okay. Imagine the shock to that society when a man began to gather families unto himself and formed a kingdom with, with an army. Before that, of course, when there was a problem, like maybe your sheep were eating my crop up, okay? I got my clan together, my family together, the men, and we came over and talked to you. And if that didn't work, something else might happen, but you understand. Or if a bear or a lion was coming into the flock and taking animals, if I wasn't enough to handle the job, maybe it was a pack of wolves, we got the clan together. But Nimrod is the first to gather many families under his authority. Now, to let the audience understand what you're talking about, Dr. Jones, here we have a man removing the direct relationship the farmers had with God. Yes. God making himself available to them, their responsibility to him. Right. And now he is amalgamating uh, a system where they're directly responsible to him, the mighty hunter. The yes. hunter of souls and the man of war and the man who literally uprooted people. So now we have a better understanding of the reason Nimrod is called a mighty hunter before God. God was watching him and he ultimately had to give an account, but now he wanted men to give an account to him rather than to God. It, Carl, you're exactly right. And what we have here is a type of the Antichrist of the end times. Yes. He's the first world dictator. Yes. Okay? And so, <clears throat> Nimrod was born in the second generation after the flood, um, after the deluge ended, and he was the 13th generation from creation. And by the way, that's why we say 13 is a bad number. In the Bible, um, this is the first time 13 comes up, and it's in a bad sense. But we're not into superstition. The law, but the law of first mention does cast first a shadow. First mention casts a shadow. Now, Notice here, when we come to the story, see, <clears throat> chapter 10 lists, um, and most Christians don't read chapter 10 because it's those genealogies that everybody hates. And they don't know how incredibly significant it is. God doesn't waste words. That's right. 